Thank you for joining us and welcome to our second webinar in our series on the strategies of high net worth families. Today's episode is on how high net worth families save tax. I'm Matt Kelson from Ellison Associates Wealth Management and I'll be moderating our session with William Ellis again here as our presenter. This episode should last about 15 minutes and if you have any questions please type them in the chat box during the session and we'll address them in the time allotted at the end. As always, we'll post a recording of this session on our website where you can view it anytime and you can also view our previous webinar, webinar episodes on our website in our content library. Our webinar today has three sections. The first is a look at how tax impacts your investments and the ability to earn income. The second is five ways that high net worth families save tax. And in the final section, William specifically addresses business owners and the tax saving strategies they can capitalize on. So William, first off, what is this chart showing us? Well, thanks, Matt. Uh, what we plotted here is how a million dollars of investment in, uh, investments that are earning 8% a year, how they grow in value under a variety of tax scenarios. And what you'll notice right away, Matt, is what I think is a shockingly divergent uh, outcome depending on how the returns are earned. The rate of return modeled here is the same in each case, but over an extended investment period of 30 years, you really notice that investments earning interest income, which are taxed at the highest tax rate, are worth less than half the value of investments that are made in capital gains where the capital gains are deferred and compounded for 30 years before being realized and capital tax being paid at the end of the 30 years. Even better than the deferred capital gains, the ideal is where earnings are sheltered from tax. Can you give us an example of that? Well, a TFSA is a good example, but that's on a modest scale. If you want to shelter serious dollars, large dollars, then we need to look at using insurance policies. I think the takeaway from this slide is that when the dollars are large, as they are for high net worth families, you really need to pay attention to how you structure your investments and how you receive your investment returns because it makes an enormous difference in the value of your capital over time. And can you quickly run through the different strategies and solutions used by high net worth families to save tax? Sure. We're going to talk about five ways here today. One is that uh, high net worth families split income. They defer income. They earn income at lower tax rates where possible. They look to invest in alternative asset classes to save taxes. And finally, they take advantage of tax shelters and what we'll call tax shields. So getting into the, some of the strategies used for high net worth families, how does splitting income affect taxes? Well, first off, the reason you want to split income between family members in other words, the reason why you want to earn income in the hands of your spouse or children is that if your spouse and children are otherwise not making, uh, making a lot of money, they're, not paying very little they're paying very little tax. If you're able to move $50,000 of income to each of them, they're going to be really paying relatively little income tax on that as opposed to what they pay in your hands. So that allows us to have income taxed at much lower tax rates. And how this is done is by either having family members earn investment income in their hands and for business owners to have them employ family, family members in their business. The tools used are family trusts, holding companies, and loans at prescribed rates. So William, here we have it again, our estimated market yield slide. How does this relate to the high net worth family's ability to save tax? Well, this slide shows what we call the estimated market yields, the rewards we expect from owning various capital assets. And if we take a closer look at the bottom two investment categories, the dividend portfolio and the growth portfolio, what we see uh, are the details of the dividend portfolio and the growth portfolio. 
For both of these portfolios, the slide shows three components of investment for, for, uh, return. Uh, the first component is the dividend yield. And for the dividend portfolio, the yield here is 4%. And for the growth portfolio, the dividend yield is 1%. That's taxed currently when you receive the dividend. The second component is the profits earned and retained in the business instead of being paid out. And in, in the case of the dividend portfolio, we see 3.5%, almost 4% retained. The growth portfolio is retaining 8 plus percent a year. The third component, though, to um, the return is the annual growth in earnings. And in the case of the dividend portfolio, it's growing at 5 to 7 percent a year. And for the, for the growth portfolio, 7 to 9 percent. So just to recap here, the first component, the dividend income received, is taxed. Whereas in the second and third components, the retained earnings and the growth in the earnings and value of the business, those are not paid out. They're not realized. So any tax is deferred into the future. And in the case of the dividend portfolio, a good half or more of the return is deferred into the future. And for the growth portfolio, more than that, the majority of the return is deferred. This results in a serious deferral of growth of uh, deferral of the payment of taxes and an enhanced compounding of the capital value of the investment until capital gains are realized in the future. And this seems like an obvious solution, earning income that is taxed at a lower rate. But can you work through how we develop the mix that is right for each family? Yeah, when we develop an asset allocation, I guess the first way, thing we look at and we are sensitive to is how comfortable a family is with the variability uh, of the month-to-month, year-to-year value of their investment statements. However, our focus is on cash flow, meaning helping families to build a portfolio that provides sufficient cash flow to meet income needs. And this involves weighing out the current market yields and what is shown here on this slide the various tax rates incurred on different types of income. So if we take a live example and compare current interest rates and dividend yields, investing for interest income, which is highly taxed, currently will yield you interest of about 2%, say, or after tax, 1%. Whereas investing in dividend income yields 4% or using the marginal rate here of 25% shown on the slide, yielding 3% after tax on the 4% dividend. So high net worth families who have sufficient capital to take a long-term view of their finances are able to look at these two alternatives, the 1% for the bonds after tax, and 3% after tax for the dividends, and emphasize the dividend portfolio with a higher after tax cash flow and the enhanced growth of income and capital values. And we touched on this in our previous webinar on the investing strategies of high net worth families, but how do alternative asset classes help to minimize tax? Well, as we talked about uh, in our last webinar on how high net worth in, uh, families invest, they use alternative assets to provide diversification and also attractive return opportunities. But in addition to those things, they often offer a combination of lower tax rates, deferral of income and tax, and additional tax write-offs or tax credits, all of which results in a lower tax bill. And what are the options for tax shelters and tax shields for our high net worth families? Well, RRSPs and TFSAs have a place, but given high net worth families invest the majority of their monies outside of those, we have to look elsewhere to write offs and deductions. And if we look at borrowing and have any borrowing within the family, we need to structure that borrowing so that it's tax deductible. And I might add, with the current cost of borrowing being lower than dividend yields, 
and the tax deduction of borrowing exceeding the marginal rate or tax bill for dividend income, after-tax leveraging investment is cash flow positive right now. And if we were to get a sell-off in the market where perhaps there was um, a large decline in value, I think you could make an argument in the right place with the right person for strategic borrowing to invest. Because in addition to the positive after-tax cash flow, especially after a, a sharp decline in the market, you'd have a, be favorably positioned for capital appreciation over the long term. Well, can you expand a bit on the spend capital unencumbered by tax? Sure. Income is tax, taxed, but capital isn't. For our high net worth families, we focus on what cash flow they need and to most efficiently generate that cash flow. And to the extent that we can draw on capital, specifically capital without embedded capital gains, you aren't attracting income tax to provide that cash flow. So we try to position portfolios to take advantage of this, advantage, of this uh, aspect. Finally, we use insurance as an asset class. Insurance has similar characteristics to long-term bonds. Unlike bonds where the interest income attracts the highest rate of taxation, both the insurance component and the investment component of insurance are tax-free. Therefore, in addition to the estate planning reasons for insurance, we look to reallocate the fixed income portion of portfolios into an insurance wrapper to greatly enhance the returns of this capital. And although you know, it's more complicated and less straightforward, for families with a holding company, there are some significant additional tax reduction strategies available with insurance. And William, as you know, we have a lot of clients that are business owners. What are the tax saving strategies that are specific for their needs? Well, three are noted here. And uh, the top one there is individual pension plans or what we call IPPs. These allow business owners and their spouses to use corporate dollars to create pensions that can be 50% or more larger than what our RSPs permit. And um, for families, it's possible to add children to the individual pension plans to allow these assets to benefit the children and as a result defer taxation of the pension assets when the parents die. Also noted here are estate freezes where the capital value of a business is frozen at a point in time, thus establishing the future capital gain and tax liability on the second death of the parents, transferring and deferring growth in the value of the business into the hands of the children. And finally, we have for business owners, again, what we mentioned earlier, insurance strategies, specifically strategies to unlock corporate retained earnings, either during their life or for the estate, and as a result, save millions of dollars in taxes currently or to the estate. And William, I have one question here. Um, why are we doing this? What, what's wrong with high net worth families paying tax? Well, I guess there's really nothing wrong with it. And in fact, if we look at the, um, the tax returns and Statistic Canada will, Canada will tell us that the top 1% of income earners in Canada pay something like 40% of to total personal income tax, and that's not including any tax that they've paid within their corporate or trust assets. So given the marginal nature of the tax system and the fact that high net worth families make more income, by definition they pay more tax. I was recently speaking to two high net worth business owners. One has a holding company with $60 million of assets and four children. He's advanced in years and very interested in how we could save $4 million of estate taxes for his family. Now another um, uh, business owner client had a similar situation but wasn't fussed about giving his children less and paying more in tax. So it really comes down to personal preference. The choice comes down to who would you like to spend your income and your capital? 
yourself while you're alive, your beneficiaries, a cause or charity that's meaningful to you, or the government. Every family is different. Some people, and I must say the majority that we come across, feel that they've paid their fair share, and so they're open to uh, alternatives to help reduce their tax bill. Well, thanks, William. And if there's no more questions from the chat, thank you for joining us today. And if you'd like to discuss today's webinar further, please feel free to contact us at 416-969-3190. Thank you, and I will now end today's session.